Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to our talk about a competitive food retail architecture with microservices. My name is Ansgar Brauner, and with me is my colleague Sebastian Gauda. Um, as already said, we both work as software architects at Rewe Digital um, and are based in Cologne, Germany. Uh, just a short overview of what we want to go to show, what we we're going to show you. Um, first, we I uh, want to tell you where, uh, where we are and where we come from. Then we will talk about um, how to scale monolithic software, how to, to find the right boundaries, how to guide your developers, and how to access the microservice architecture. Uh, there's time for questions in the end of the talk, so uh, please be patient. First, our history. Um, Rewe Group is um, a retail company in, in, in Germany based, but also um, spread all over Europe. So there are uh, shops here as well. Um, it's quite a big enterprise. It's about fi uh, 54 billion euros in turnover, more than 300,000 um, employees, and more than 15,000 shops in Europe. It's not only about food retail, it's also about uh, tourism and do-it-yourself markets. And the company was founded in 1927, so it's almost 19 years old. And um, you might recognize some of these uh, brands here. I saw already Billa is um, available in Sofia too. And Penny was, I think, not sure, I haven't seen a market. And in 2014, uh, a new digital hub was founded. This is the Rewe Digital. Rewe Digital, um, which should take care of um, the digital transformation of the Rewe Group. Um, the digital units are based um, mainly in Cologne, but there are also um, units based in Berlin, and in Germany, in Vienna, Austria, and soon we will open an office here in uh, Sofia. So, um, our history, where we uh, come from with the digital unit in there will be some concepts in here uh, which will be explained later on, so don't mind if you get the, don't get the words. Um, there will be enough information about this. We started in 2014 with two teams, about 10 developers, and um, took over the mono, uh, um, a monolithic uh, software stack, um, a shop a software built by an external partner, and um, had to implement features in there but uh, realized very soon that uh, the, the, the work on a monolithic software doesn't uh, fit when we want to scale. Um, in summer 2014, the first architect was hired and the first ta task this platform architect got was uh, find a way to, um, to uh, scale the company, to sca scale the technology department, but also scale the, um, the technology platform. The solution he came up with is um, all about microservices and uh, for, for the technical part, and uh, the solution for the organizational part is uh, something we call Squad, which is adapted from the Spotify organization model where we picked some parts into our organization platform. Later in 2015, we uh, realized that the data, ba uh, data, data center-based um, infrastructure is not fitting our needs anymore, and we decided to introduce Docker and Docker Swarm to enable the teams to deploy their software independently and to uh, move forward very fast without waiting on uh, ordering new machines and setting them up and stuff like this. So this was the main reason for that. In early 2016, we released a new shopping app. Um, this was the first product which was based on the new microservice infrastructure and um, facilitates it, so um, there is some production experience with this setup. Um, we didn't stop scaling, so um, in 2016 we were about 25 teams, and we noticed that there might be um, too much work for two platform architects, so we introduced the role of a software architect, taking care of, um, of one specific domain in our, in our platform um, at a lower flight level, so with more details in it. And, of course, it didn't stop there. Uh, right now, we are about 30 to 35 teams. We extracted a new core domain. Um, we switched the wording from 
And in a technical perspective, from we are talking about platforms, and in an organizational perspective, we are talking about uh, tribes and organized squads inside tribes and teams inside those squads. Yeah, so the first question uh, we had was how to scale this monolith. And um, by scaling, I mean in a technical and in an organizational way. And as, uh, as Ansgar already said, we had two teams, and we already knew that there were more to come. Our management had big ideas of new features, and uh, we already knew that we had to think about 20 or 30 teams. So what we did was, um, or what, what our first architect did was he had two design goals he figured out. The first one is vertical boundaries, which means we want to have modular independent services dealing with business domains, so that one team per domain, that's easy to scale. If you have a new domain, you can put a second team be beside it. And the second one is decentralization. That means that we uh, wanted to, to delegate the decision making and the control to the team. So power to the people. We didn't want to have all that um, decision making top down, but we wanted to, have to give it to the teams. And when you have these two goals, you easily end up with microservices. Um, this is a pretty mandatory slide for a, a microservice talk. Who of you knows what Conway's law means? Well, that's not too many, so I'm going to explain it. Uh, Conway's law basically means that um, the way you, you, you organize your teams and, and their communication defines the system structure you, you, you'll end up with. So, for example, if you have, a, if you have, if you have layered teams, for example, a, a front-end team, a back-end team, and a database team, you end up in a classic monolithic system with layers. And if, you won't, and, and if you don't want to have that, you need to reorganize your teams. And then the next question is, but, but how to organize them? What's, what's a good way to do that? And uh, yeah, these are some, some examples of, of uh, horizontals you have. In this example, you have front-end, QA, analytics, middleware, back-end, and ops. And these are all topics you want to cover. So in, in, in many organizations, you have special teams doing this. So we have a front-end team, you have a QA team, and so on. And that means that you have much, much communication between each other. So the front-end team is involved in every feature you, 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 you design that has the front-end. The QA team needs to do all the tests and so on. So that's pretty complicated. And our solution is, or the, the most common solution is to cut vertical teams. So you have, uh, you have teams that is capable of front-end, of QA, and so on. And one solution would be to put a front-end guy in there and a QA guy in there, and then you have maybe six or eight people. But that's getting tricky. Um, for example, if a QA guy goes to vacation for three weeks, that shouldn't mean that uh, there are no tests done in the three weeks. So uh, be uh, the better approach is to, to uh, to have T-shaped developers which are capable of everything, so the front-end guy should know what the back-end does, and the QA guy sh shouldn't be the one who writes the tests only, but is the one, the, the go-to guy uh, where the other ones can go to and ask how can I uh, do my tests properly. And for example, ops, it's, it's pretty uh, common that uh, the, the, the um, ops guy is uh, also developing, and the developers know how the operation works. And in the end, you can put a new team beside this. So that here you have three teams. If you have a, no, a new core domain, you can just put another team in it, staff it with the people who are capable of doing the stuff, and then you scale. So our next question was how to determine this boundary. So we already made the decision for microservices. We did this, this vertical cuts, but we didn't know exactly where to cut. So we're wondering what are our domains, and they are some approaches to do that, you can do arbitrary cuts and yeah, hope that it's good. You can do this data-driven that leads to some, to some problems. But what we realized is that it's very uh, important to understand what your domains are and how the processes work there. And as we are an e-commerce company, there's one special process you always have, that's the user journey. So we took the... Oh, so. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, so the, the first uh, step you have in, in, in a user journey we call site landing, and that is mainly about attracting and retaining customers. So how comes the customer to our site? How do we welcome him and, and so on? The next step is product discovery. That's the process of how to find your stuff, for example, search or recommendations. 
then comes checkout. Uh, it's for example a basket and then and the payment. And last but not least, we have fulfillment. So that you need to be sure that the goods the customer ordered gets 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 to him. And in our case, it's a little bit complicated because we don't ship parcels, but we uh, deliver to your doorstep. So there are many fulfillment processes we need to cover. And then you have uh, some horizontal blocks which don't fit into the customer journey. That's, um, for example, product information because all these blocks need proper product information. You have some back office processes. We have mobile, which is kind of special because in a, in a mobile world you need to ship a whole application to the app store. So we're, we're not able to split the mobile guys up into each of the teams, so we have to have a yeah, closed group of mobile developers. And we, we have a platform um, squad with, uh, that uh, deals with uh, supportive services, for example, authentication and, and mail. And all these blocks are, uh, we, we, we call them building blocks, and they, in, in, an, in an organization review, that means they are squads, and the squad has different teams and subdomains and services. Yeah, and that's how we did our organization. Now that the organization was done, we were wondering how could we guide our developers? Because uh, as you saw, um, all teams are working on the whole stack. Every team has a front-end guy and has to deal with databases and so on, and there's a good chance that people will build funny things with it. And um, yeah, the, we needed to find a balance between standardization and autonomy. So if you standardize too much, you lose the advantage of the, of the decentralization. If you do too much autonomy, you're getting chaos. So what we did, you already know these two design goals, and on top of these design goals, we um, uh, invented some architectural principles. These are just nine, so it's really easy, and everybody should understand what they are. And they are yeah, kind of laws, and they're mainly about three topics, uh, autonomy, automation, and communication. And on top of that, we have um, what we call guides, because this uh, code of law sometimes a little, uh, yeah, leaves too much room for interpretation, and the the developers ask us to be a little more specific, and we uh, we wrote these guides. They are, uh, yeah, it's this uh, RFC pattern uh, must, could, should, so really easy to read and to understand. And they we've, we've uh, written them for uh, practical tasks. So, for example, eventing. We have a guide for REST APIs for authentication and so on. And this altogether is a pretty good mix to give some autonomy, but also some standardization that things don't get too chaotic. Yeah, as uh, Sebastian already mentioned, um, the main focus we have is to have autonom autonomous uh, development teams, so the decision, decision can, be, can be made in the teams without asking anyone else, without um, interfering with other teams and without interfering um, with, with other technologies, so the teams should be able to deliver their features from, from the beginning to end, and uh, they, they should... Um, should do this um, yeah, as easy as possible. Um, so um, the, the principles for this are um, first deploy independently. So we want every team to be able to deploy their software whenever they want to deploy their software, whenever they um, need to deploy their software as often as they want to deploy their software. So they should be independent um, in their deployments. This means not only um, that they can deploy software whenever they want without, dis uh, without um, disturbing anyone else, but this means also that all other deployments do not uh, disturb your service or do not um, interfere with your service. So all other teams can deploy whenever they want um, as well. The next one is um, that we want to isolate failure. We encourage our teams to strive for very high isolation. Um, we use Hystrix to encapsulate um, the, the um, requests we make to other services. So if someone else's uh, service is broken, uh, your service should still be working and at least should deliver a default, um, default answer and should not be affected by, by other services when they are down, when they are deploying or something else. Um, the next one is um, hide implementation details. Um, this um, mainly means that, um, especially in different verticals, you do not share anything. So especially you do not share any state. 
So um, the data distribution is done asynchronously and uh, state should be only in your service and only in your service. So um, this way um, you don't rely on state from other services and no one else relies on your service and you can change your service, you can rewrite it from scratch and you can um, keep the interfaces stable and um, don't uh, interfere with other services. Um, the last one is uh, encapsulate data storage. Uh, this one is a little bit tricky. Um, every service should be uh, responsible for, for his data and should all the data it has um, uh, it needs for, to fulfill a request should be available in the service itself. So um, we, we use um, tools to distribute the data between the services, but um, at least one service or only one service is responsible for this data and um, the, the other services have to keep the data in their own services and they don't have to ask other services for data. Of course, uh, this setup brings, uh, brings some challenges. Um, the, the biggest one we, we noticed from a developer's perspective is that um, the, this autonomy in the teams leads to, um, to a different thinking from the, from the product perspective. So when, you, when you're talking to product owners, they always talk about features um, affecting uh, the, the complete shop. They want, to want something on the start, on the landing page, and it should be reflected also on the checkout. Um, so this is something which, which won't work anymore, where you break up this isolation, and this means that product owners have to think about um, how to split the features into smaller uh, parts, which can be developed and deployed independently, and this means they might have to reduce the scope, they have to split it and make it um, that small that it fits into one team, or at least into one vertical, into one squad. Uh, we came up with uh, a few patterns which helped us there. One is the data integration pattern. This basically means that um, when if one service uh, is developed faster than the other one, for, for instance, the product detail service um, is developed very fast and they want to display a new product detail page, they um, can use feature toggles on the one hand, but they can also use the data they get. So what we, what we did there is um, the product detail service developed his new product detail page and developed every information and uh, every, everything is displayed on there. But the decision when this page is, when this new page, this new template is used, is made by the service itself and it relies on the data the service gets. So as soon as from product information, new data comes into the service and new attributes are in the product data available, the service can decide on its own that it now has to display the new product detail page and don't have to display the old one. So um, you can uh, decouple the teams this way and you can, can use, um, beside feature targets, you can use the data to determine uh, when to display the new version for, um, for your service. And every service itself can decide on, uh, on this, this that way. Another thing we came up with is an evolving implementation. Uh, this basically means that um, we encourage our teams to start with a simple but fitting implementation and that we want them to implement it just for their needs. And after that, um, if a second team comes in and has a similar need or a slightly different need, it starts implementing it again in their service. So we are not copying uh, libraries around, we are not writing libraries at the moment. We encourage our teams to look at the source code from other teams and to uh, see how they solve the problem and then uh, come up with a better fitting solution for your problem, for your current problem. And this way the implementation involves over the time and gets better and better. Um, for uh, Kafka integration, I think we have five or six different implementations right now. And in the end, of course, the first team can also adopt the latest implementation, but this is also uh, decoupled because they can adapt the implementation whenever they have time to um, adapt the implementation and when there's no that much feature pressure on the team, so there's time left and they can um, improve their own, their first implementation of this. Um, Autonomous teams come always with autonomous tech stacks. So what you see here is um, 
the, mole, or the, the biggest parts in our tech stack, most of the teams currently, uh, 35 as I said, are using uh, Java and Spring Boot. There are some Scala teams, there are some Clojure teams in there. In the infrastructure area, there's also Node.js and Golang in, in place. And on the infrastructure side, to deploy the infrastructure, we have um, Docker, as I said, we, have, we use Apache Kafka, we use Ansible to provisioning the, the machines for that, and in the future, we will move to the, to the Google Cloud to make it much easier for the teams and uh, have a bigger infrastructure than a data center can uh, deliver in time. Next thing is automation, and uh, the important part here is um, that we want our teams to be scalable. So they uh, should be highly scalable, they should be scalable horizontally, and um, we, um, we, we need this because we don't know which, uh, which load comes to our system. If a commercial is running, then uh, it might, might be a uh, little bit more than on, that, on an average day. And um, a good tip for this to, to ensure scalability from the very beginning is to tell your teams always to uh, do never start with just one single instance. So even on development, development machines, even on integration um, environments, always have at least two or three instances running and make sure that all the problems, they come with scalability and concurrency and uh, three or five instances running. Uh, make sure you have these problems at the very beginning of your development and you solve them before you move to production. The uh, next thing is we want to um, embrace a culture of automation to enable this, uh, this, this scalability. And this means, uh, in, the, in, the, in the first case, automate everything you can. And in, in detail, this means automate your tests, automate your deployments, automate all your ops works, and uh, try, try to enable everything uh, which can be automated, should be automated. And uh, this enables your teams later on to scale quickly, put on new machines in there, run the test very often, and um, things like this. The last one here is be highly observable. Um, we use uh, semantic monitoring for this, so we also, uh, we also test our applications for, um, every time in production. So it's not only that we test our, uh, our applications when we develop them, we, we also run tests um, on a regular basis against our production systems. And um, of course, we, we use um, concepts like correlation ID, so you can trace your, your call through all, through all the services. And um, tools like Zipkin, there was a talk yesterday, you might have heard, um, which is also a good idea to uh, implement this in your services. So the final step is communication, and communication gets pretty important when you have a when you have uh, autonomous teams, because the more autonomous your, your infrastructure is, the more important it is to have a proper communication. And this is why we have our most guides uh, on, on the communication part. So there are just two principles we have there. The first one is pretty easy. Uh, if you have a synchronous API, do it RESTful, end of story. And the second one is standardized service communication. So we have, we offer the teams some, some possible ways of communication, but we tell them to uh, always go asynchronous if you can. And why is that? Um, it's pretty simple sentence is having data is better than fetching data. Because when you have all your data you need locally, then you're pretty re resilient at, at request time. So if you, if you don't have to call this and that's service at, at, at request time, that's, that's a cool thing to have but that leads to duplication of data. And that is, this is what we want, and this is pretty tricky because um, developers learn in the university that uh, duplication of data is bad and you, you wanna have one big database and the source of truth, and um, yeah, if, if, you, if you're dealing in microservice world, that's not the truth anymore. So we need to transition the way of thinking uh, with the developers. Um, there are some cases when you need to uh, communicate synchronously. That the first is when it's time critical. For example, if you have a checkout with it and you want to go from step two to step three, um, if you do this asynchronously, maybe on the third step the data isn't available. So you need to be sure that the, that the data you put in, in, in step two is available in step three and you do this synchronously. 
for example. Uh, another thing is front end. If you, if you do a front end call from front end to back end, is uh, synchronous too in most ways. And maybe uh, if, if the team that is dealing with this data is already in the transition of, of going asynchronous, maybe the data isn't available yet. So then you, you call the REST service in the meantime and uh, port it to, to uh, asynchronous communication afterwards. So we have a concept we call eventing um, that's a little different from event sourcing. I will show you what the difference is. And uh, the, the implementation we have is Kafka. I will give you just a little example of what we mean. Uh, imagine you have a service called customer data service and it deals with uh, customer's core data. Maybe it has a front end a form where, where, the, where the customers can put in his data and it gets stored in the database. After it gets stored there, we publish it to queue, this, uh, called the customer queue here. And now imagine there's another service uh, It's called the invoice service. It's uh, capable of, um, of making a nice PDF of your invoice and it's interested in this uh, customer core data because the name of the customer has to be written on the invoice. So then it, uh, the, the invoice service subscribes all these customers on the queue and stores it in its own database. So in fact, it has a copy of the of the original data. But when a request comes now in and the customer wants this invoice, the invoice service is capable of rendering the, the uh, invoice address straight away and it, and it doesn't need to communicate uh, to anywhere. So there might be another service, uh, it's called a checkout service, same thing, it subscribes the customers and uh, stores it into its own database because it needs some customer data for the checkout process. So now you would think that's yeah pretty stupid because we have uh, copies of all the data, and maybe the invoice service has a lot of data it doesn't really need, and therefore um, um, we, had a, we have a concept that the, the, the customer data service in this case puts all the data he has for one resource on the queue, but the services consuming it are just taking this part of the data they need. So for example, the invoice service is interested in the invoice address, so it takes this along with a customer ID and the name, and the checkout service is rather interested in the delivery address, and it takes this one and the customer ID and the name. So that's just a simple uh, example. And uh, what's important is that this eventing is not messaging, so we're always pushing events, uh, publishing events that already happened in the past. It's not that one service tells another service what to do, but it tells them, Something has happened with my data, here are the details. If you're interested, please read it. If not, skip it. And what's important is it's, uh, that there's only one owning service per topic. And by this, we um, make sure that we have no uh, consistency problems. Because if there's just one publishing service, there are no uh, concurring rights on the queue. And yeah, this, as, I, as I already mentioned, that gives you independence at request time. And then we publish only complete entities and no deltas, and that's different from event sourcing. Um, so we, have, we wanna have atomic e events so that somebody consuming it doesn't need to collect some events to get the whole picture, but there's just one message per, per resource. And what you can do is uh, lock compaction. That means if you have, let's say, uh, 10 changes on a customer's data set, then you can skip the first nine ones and just delete them because the truth is written in the last update. So this is pretty handy because uh, yeah, the, the queues don't get so big. And finally, you can do rewriting and rereading. That means if there's an additional flag coming on in, in, the, in the customer data service, it just adds this and rewrites all the stuff to the queue and all the ones that are interested in it can reconsume it and have the data in there. So that's a pretty good... Uh, Pretty good approach here, and you can do rereading. So, if, for example, a new service pops up, it can just it can just connect to the queue and collect all the data from the start, and it's uh, ready to start. There are some lessons we've learned with microservice APIs. The first one is Kafka or asynchronous way of messaging is an API as well. That's even clear because they have all the same uh, JSON format. It even looks the same. So that's, that's an API as well. And yeah, everything that goes for a synchronous API nearly goes for an asynchronous API as well. And we learned that writing APIs is pretty hard because teams tend to write APIs for special clients. As Ansgar already said, the first client was this mobile app. 
and all the services um, supporting the app and, and, and writing APIs um, made pretty special APIs for this mobile case. And in the end, when the, when the new client came along, it was getting yeah, pretty hard to match, and there were some breaking changes they had, and it was pretty hard to, yeah, to get this uh, back together again. So, and, and that's a third thing. Uh, uh, third thing you have here is um, breaking changes, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, there are three golden rules for breaking changes. First one is uh, avoid breaking changes. The second one is please avoid breaking changes, and the third one, if you really cannot, <laughs> yeah. and if you really can avoid it, do it exactly this way. So there's a, a little uh, example. Uh, imagine you have a resource with an, with an API and two clients uh, on it, and both um, clients are consuming this API, and then for some reason the resource needs to do a breaking change. So what you do then is um, offer a new format of this, of, this, of this API, but you keep the, the, the other endpoint alive. And then you need to ask all the teams running these clients to, to move to your new API. So maybe after some time, client B is, is ready and has time uh, to do this. It's cool, but you still need to keep this, uh, this up and running until the last client has, uh, has exited the old format, and then you can skip it. And in this example, it's just two clients, which is pretty easy, but uh, right now we're running about 100 microservices, so it's, it's not untypical that there are 20 clients connected to your API, and you need to talk to all the teams running these clients and to ask them kindly to uh, please put a story in your backlog and move to your own new API. And therefore, we need the developers to think really hard about what, how they design their APIs up front and to more create generic APIs than rather for this, the first client that shows up. Yeah, and the last, um, the last topic to mention is um, how, to, how to exit this, this um, microservice architecture and how to access the, the single services. Um, we will focus uh, in a few minutes about uh, the, the front-end access, but before that we also mention which uh, ways to access we have in our infrastructure. Um, we use API gateways to encapsulate our, um, our platform. Uh, and to um, to enrich the requests for uh, for the uh, for the services themselves. So we have at the moment, uh, I think uh, those three are up to date. We have um, a terminal gateway which is used in the shops, where the customer can uh, print out recipes and then go shopping manually, as everyone from uh, every one of us does. Um, the second one is the, the UI gateway. This is where we um, have a deeper look in a few minutes. And uh, the last one is a mobile API gateway, which serves um, the, the mobile APIs for our apps. Um, all of those gateways are capable of three main, uh, uh, three main tasks or three main, three main functionalities. They all uh, take care of routing to the correct service, so they, they know which service is requested. They are taking care of the authentication of the customer, of other clients and um, enrich the request and request headers with this information so the a single service doesn't have to take care of this. And um, they all offer some kind of composition. So um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the web browser, this means uh, the web page is composed. In the mobile API, this can mean that uh, requests are composed and only one response is sent to the mobile to save bandwidth and uh, to aggregate the request from, from many services in the, in the background and then go to the mobile where you have lower bandwidth and don't want to make 100 requests. Uh, as I said, we want to have a deeper look into our front-end composition. This is something we, we came up with. Um, at this point of time, we didn't find some, something uh, similar capable of this. There are systems like Edge Site Includes, which can um, handle some parts of this but we didn't find a solution which fits our needs. And what you see here is an example product detail page. Um, you have uh, the product detail data in the, main, in the main area, and you have a header on top of it, and this header is composed from different parts. Um, for instance, we, we picked the, the basket flyout where all your items pop up if you click on this. Um, you have uh, the search bar, you have the navigation bar inside this, this header, typical uh, e-commerce setup here. And um, we have 
the uh, the basket the add to basket button uh, on on this page, and uh, the advantage of composing the front end from your microservices is that um, in this case, particularly the add to basket button is also maintained by the basket team and they deliver the add to basket button. So the only communication if someone presses the add to basket button um, to get this item into the basket flyout is on the top right. Uh, the only communication, communication which has to happen here is communication inside one team. So they know how their software works and they can communicate through, um, through an event bus in the front end and also their backend calls are only encapsulated in one team. So this um, enables the teams to be autonomous and um, to deliver parts of the web page and uh, the gateway is taken care of combining all those parts to, uh, to one page again. We came up with uh, a few constraints to, to build the solution. There were two solutions running for, uh, or two, two software stacks running for this solution. And um, the, the constraints we had um, uh, were that there should be no dedicated front-end team. So we realized in the, in the mobile world we cannot avoid this because there's really one app which has to deploy to the app stores. Um, this needs to be one team, um, but in the, in the web, uh, environment we want to avoid this. So we don't want to have dedicated front-end teams there and um, want to have the front-end developers in every team which needs to provide front-end. Um, the next thing is we um, want to deliver CSS and JavaScript from the services themselves. And this is where Edge Site includes might, uh, might find their, uh, might find their, their, their borders or cannot achieve this, so uh, not in a not in an easy way. Um, we want our services to deliver everything which is needed for, for this add to basket button or for the search bar you saw in the, in the picture before. Um, we also want all our service to be uh, A-B testable, so um, the information from the gateway which resolves the customer, um, the gateway enriches uh, this information, which test group is the customer in, which, uh, which zip code does the customer have, which um, products he bought in the past or whatever, and then we can decide which groups apply to this customer and this should be distributed to all services, so every service can react on this uh, information and can deliver A or B or whatever is to deliver to, uh, to make testing of new features available to, um, to the teams and to the business side as well. Uh, the next, uh, the last one on, on the slide is that um, we, we talked about it already that the authentication is um, handled by the gateway components. So we want to make sure that the authentication is done right and we want to make it um, available. We want to avoid um, to do it a uh, hundred times in a hundred services. So uh, we put it into this gateway component and we decided to do it there only once enriching the information in, in, the, in the original request header, the same pattern as for the other informations, and um, this information is also spread to, down to the services, and the services can rely on this information and uh, can, can get the customer ID from, from, from this information and know it's an authenticated request. So, how does this look like? Um, this is the flow we, we have through, uh, from, from the browser th through our um, platform. Step one, the request comes in and enters our platform. Uh, first thing to do is resolve authentication and um, determine test groups, uh, translate the session back into uh, what, what we needed. So there's encrypted session data uh, sent with the request and we decrypt it and put it also into headers. Um, then uh, the tricky part begins. This uh, gateway component um, has a lookup table in it which can be configured from the teams and from the different services themselves. And this lookup table for the product detail page, for instance, um, says, okay, responsible for the main template of the product detail page is the product detail service itself. So uh, the next thing the, uh, this gateway component does is it asks the product detail service, please give me your template. And um, the possibility for the product detail service is 
to um, render the data the service needs and the, ser uh, the data the service already knows. For instance, the product picture, the product description and stuff like this uh, could al already be rendered into this template and is already delivered the right way. But this template which comes from, uh, from the service also has include markers in there. And those include markers are resolved by the gateway and um, the gateway then has to look which uh, services do I have to call, um, which, uh, where do I get the data. This is uh, done in parallel, so all, if there are 20 includes in the, in the template, um, 20 requests can be made, the services can answer, and as you saw in the, um, in the header area, there we have a recursive template, so the header service is asked for the template of the header service, it can put the information of he knows already in there, but he also has to include um, another includes into itself. So um, he includes the basket fly out, the search bar, which comes from the search service, and the navigation bar, which comes from the navigation service. Um, if all the templates are resolved, all snippets are available to the, to the gateway component, the gateway component looks into them, takes the um, JavaScript out of it, puts it on the bottom of the page in the order the uh, includes were made in the main template. It takes the CSS out of the page and puts the includes of the CSS on top of the page, also in the order they were, the includes were made in the original template. And after that, everything is finished. The page is, um, e exists in this moment and can be delivered to the, to the, to the requesting browser. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. You got your product detail page. Um, this is, um, we started with it one and a half year ago. And at that point of time, we didn't find um, a, a system which, which was capable of that. Other companies like uh, Zalando had similar approaches to this and also built um, kind of that <coughs> software stack. To, to do this, but this is also, uh, this is always a problem we think, um, which is not solved when you move to microservices. So microservices open, often end with a lot of requests between the services and one is delivering the front end, and this is what um, avoids autonomy of the teams in the end. So this is our approach to deliver one page from different services. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, we have seven minutes left for questions. Uh, to make it easier, wait for the mic, and <laughs> everyone else gets the question. Thank you. I would like to hear something about uh, distributed transactions. This problem, how you solve it with microservices, uh, to give a little bit of context uh, in my company, uh, there was such an opinion that this should be handled by some very enterprise service bus, which is, uh, you know, with Kafka and things like that, uh, it is already something else. So can you, can you tell, tell me, uh, explain how, or do you face such problems? Um, we do face such problems, and this is what uh, Sebastian mentioned. Um, we usually try to avoid uh, distributed transactions. So when we really need to have a transaction, we, we are avoiding transact or we, we, we leave the asynchronous communication and we go to synchronous communication to ensure the transaction happens. Yeah, a couple of, what about the case when a couple of microservices are involved uh, then? How, how you, you combine uh, all the blocking calls? Uh, um, actually, what is the rollback procedure? How, uh, how each and every microservice have its own rollback? Uh, in in yeah. the end, in the end, yes. So the, the, the services have to take care of this. In the end, that's, that's definitely a problem. Um, lucky us, we, we don't have that much of these problems. In the checkout area, there is something where we need to be transactional. So we don't want the, uh, the, the order to be modified before we created an order, but after we receive the payment or something like this. So this is uh, the, the case. Um, where, where you have uh, such problems, but um, what we usually do there is that we have an overall um, service taking care of this transaction and talking to others, and then the truth is s still in one, uh, in one place. So this could be one solution for that. 
Other questions? Over there. So thank you for the great talk. And uh, I have a couple of questions. So couple. first of all, <laughs> uh, first of all, for the gateway components, who is responsible? So if I change something in microservice A, do I need to go and change something in the gateway components as well? Uh, this is this is what we would try to avoid. The gateway component is configurable via an API, so the teams can set um, set a configuration uh, themselves, but they don't need to change the gateway component itself. So they, if they have a new service and it's responsible for a new route to uh, to display not the product detail page but maybe the product overview page. Uh, then uh, they can decide, okay, my product overview service is responsible for the template, and they tell, it, tell this to the service they can do within the deployment and uh, can assign times, toggles to this when it should be active, and uh, then uh, the teams are autonomously uh, still. So the gateway component is pretty stable. This is one of the Node.js components we have, and um, it's based on Node.js and Express, and um, pretty much, it, so there were a few new features in the last time, but in the, in the last time it, it really stabilized and hadn't so much changes in it. And one more question. Uh, so when you dynamically combine your UI, uh, is it possible that uh, a developer skipped a semicolon and it crashes the whole UI? How do you handle with uh, this isolation of failure that you may have? Uh, if, if the, if the uh, gateway can't parse the snippet, then it has a fallback. You can always configure fallback, and then it says, uh, well, um, sorry, I can't render this, or it has some default data you can put there. So, yeah, but, but you, as, as a single service, you can't crush the whole page. So the, um, to get, give you a more, few more details about it, we, we have new HTML tags in our templates, and those HTML tags have data attributes in there where uh, which service to call and uh, how to resolve it. And inside those HTML tags can also be a default um, default implementation or fallback. So if um, if it's empty, nothing is displayed. So maybe you don't have uh, a basket flyout uh, uh, icon on the top of the page, but at least the page in, uh, at all renders and there's, a, there's not a problem. If the service goes down, same thing. If the service is not reachable, the default is rendered and um, Hopefully, it doesn't break the complete platform. Other questions? In some of your previous slides, you mentioned a monolithic application. Did you guys actually had your product as a monolith? And uh, what was the process of breaking it up into microservices? Yeah, to be honest, the monolithic system is not dead. That's because the management always wants new, new fancy features, and uh, we don't get the time to, yeah, to uh, rebuild or to, to, to throw the old stuff away. So yeah, there's something left. Maybe it's 20 or 30 percent or something. Yeah. So it's 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 always a bit a bit, a bit tricky to, uh, to 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 convince the management to do the yeah the complete transformation. So um, what you, what you have there is. Um every new feature which comes in is only built in services. So, and if this means we have to extract old functionality from, from this monolithic software before we can start with this, then we try to do this. But um, as Sebastian mentioned, it's, it's hard to, to argue with this. So there is something left, but it's, uh, it's getting smaller and smaller. And so this is part of the transition. So the other, the other option would be to um, to invest one or two years with a lot of developers, rebuild everything from scratch, and this is something we, we didn't want to decide for, and we didn't want to go for, so we, we decided for breaking it up part by part and um, extracting new services to it, and then uh, takes, it takes a little time. Uh, hi guys, thanks for the good presentation. I have a question. You uh, said that each service has its own database and duplicated, et cetera. Is there a master uh, database or master record that is used from each one? Because in one of the services, every data was there, but on the other services, some of data is presented. So is there a master data? So there's no master database. Every service um, has its own 
database and it's taking care of its own database. Um, when, uh, so there is a database cluster where all those databases reside in, so we don't build up a cluster for every service, this is uh, right. Um, when you think about the transition to, to the Google Cloud, um, you can imagine every service has its own cloud, cloud SQL instance attached to it. And then, of course, we don't have to take care about um, this uh, operational stuff, but at the moment we have one uh, Postgres cluster running, but there's no single database which all services share. So this is, this is the main topic. Services don't share databases. This is only an infrastructure problem we, we have to solve. Okay, but for example, uh, if in the first service you have a, a invoice and uh, a target address or shipping address, but on a later stage, if the checkout service introduces a new data uh, that is uh, required by the customer data service, but on a later stage, who's gonna populate this in order for this customer data service to have this data? So um, the customer data service is the only one who is publishing data. If you want to change data, if you want to change customer data, you have to do it with the customer data service. So the checkout service or the invoice service in this example never change the data. They, they have their own entity, so they have an invoice, they have an order they, they create. And this is these are the entities the invoice service is publishing, or this is these are the entities the, the checkout service is publishing. And they might include a reference to a customer ID, but uh, they never change customer data. The only one who's changing this is the customer data service. And if there's need for more data, then um, of course someone has to take care of it and has to ask the customer data uh, guys to implement this. But uh, in the end, uh, the systems are growing and getting bigger and bigger. And as uh, Sebastian mentioned in the very beginning, um, especially in the area of fulfillment, if you think about all this delivery uh, stuff in the end, the, it's, it's a really big system, and um, you cannot avoid such, such uh, things at all. So okay, one last short question. Yes, thank you for the talk. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, you split the monolithic application to microservices. I missed the beginning, the very beginning of the talk, so maybe, maybe you talked about it. But uh, uh, how many microservices you have, or uh, do you have like one microservice per team, or several microservices? When you add new feature, uh, you add new microservice, or it depends on on the team size. Yeah, well, that that differs a lot. There are teams that own only one service, M maybe some 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 bigger service, and there are teams. Um, one one of my teams has about seven or eight microservices, but they're, they're rather small, so yeah. But that's, that's, not, that's not the best way to handle it. Better would be if, if you could keep the numbers of domains small in, in your team. But this is, uh, yeah, we, we would like to grow faster than we do now. We already have 35 teams, and I think it's yeah, getting towards 70 or 80. So yeah, we have to fix that then. So what you can, what you can say is um, one service is owned by maximum one team but one team owns more than one service. And there are teams, um, this Node.js team, they are putting out services every week, uh, five or seven. They are really small, but they, they have a lot of them. So um, it, it depends on the team very much. Um, the important thing is one service is never shared between teams. This is the most important thing here. <laughs>